So today, I wanted to highlight, last week we spoke about how, well, Pastor Andrew was here actually last week, but the last time I preached here and in Holland, I spoke on God is working. I spoke on how in the Bible, often when you were to snapshot a moment where Herod kills all the babies, where Pharaoh kills all the babies, whenever God is doing something, the devil tries to stop it. And often we'll look at what the devil is doing and the news will report us what the devil is doing, but what we fail to see is God always moves first and the devil acts in response because the devil's not creative nor is he prophetic. Those are, those are God's characters. And so when God births something, breathes something, the devil recognizes it and his response is to try and create a narrative that looks like God hasn't started something. So when Moses is born at that time, all the babies are getting killed and thrown in the Nile. When Jesus is born at that time, all the babies are getting killed. And if you were living in that time, you would have paused and said, if anything I can accept in today's day and age, you would have said God has abandoned us. Today we sing around Christmas, God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus born unto us, and we, we remember Jesus being given to us as a gift to humanity. And, but at the time, it didn't feel like God had showed up. It felt like the devil was the strongest he'd ever been. Only in hindsight did we see God was working, right? And so in that setting, I wanted to speak to us today because I feel like a big part of us seeing God work, partnering with God in what he wants to do. Because you know, God has declared it, but we have to enforce it. Amen? Grace is our identity, but faith is our authority. God has said, I've done it. But now you, by faith, have to actually activate that, right? So when we, I don't mean partner in what God does, God redeems us, God restores us, God fulfills the law, God is declaring us righteous, but now when we walk by faith, our part in walking this out, God has actually equipped us for that. And so often when we look at our lives, we will see a circumstance, we'll see an environment, we'll see a situation. And in the natural, we will say, like I was talking about a few weeks ago, oh, if anything, I can tell you, Pastor, God is not in control. If anything, I can tell you based on the news today, Pastor, uh, the devil is Christians just need to hide. We just need to put our heads in the sand. We just need to accept our allotment. We just need to, you know, go by the way things are. You know, the church can't expect to grow. The church can't expect to see supernatural financial supply. We can't expect to see people live longer. We can't expect people to be, to, because you know what? The, the sign of the times, Pastor, is actually, it's the worst time. It's the worst time to expand. It's the worst time to move forward. It's the worst time to speak favor over people's lives. Look at the economy. Rather get people to just draw back. Rather get people to just accept. Rather get people to just live, you know. But that's not the Spirit of God. In fact, all throughout the Bible, we see in situations where it looks like the devil is running the show, God actually is working and is actually using it. So what I wanted to speak on today is it's not a setback, it's actually a setup. I wanted to let you know if you would receive it for yourself, all that is conspiring against you, all that has gone on, God can and wants to use for His glory for you to walk in victory. Of course, it can remain a setback as long as it's in our strength, as long as it's by our wisdom, as long as it's by our effort. Of course, it can hold us back, it can limit us. Of course, we can find ourselves giving up, walking away, saying, oh my goodness. But if you would actually hear what the Holy Spirit is saying is actually that God is working to set it up. But there is a way you can miss the hand of God, stop the favor of God, hinder a move of God, 
And there is a way you can release it, engage it, tap into it. So there's a famous passage of scripture, which I'm not going to teach too long on this morning, but it's a, let's just go there. Zechariah chapter four, verses six. We'll unpack this in time. But fundamentally, here's a situation where the people of God are trusting God for something supernatural, and prophetically a word comes to them, and it says, right, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Now, we know that the spirit of God has might, it has power, in fact, it's described as the power of God. But if we look into the actual words used here, might there is human wealth and human talent. So it is your natural ability to do something, your talent, right? Also, let's be honest, how many of us, whenever we look forward, we always come to one immediate reflection as to whether something is possible or not. What's the first thing we think about? Our spouse. No! <laughs> our pastor. No! Our children. No. We think about money. Like that's the whole... The, in fact, the world would say, if you want to summarize how life is, that's the first thing people think about. If you got lots, if you're making more money, it was a good year. Forget if everything else fell apart. Forget if your health is falling apart. Forget if your relationships are falling apart. If you're making more money, that's all that matters, right? And to see God move in your life, this is one of the disqualifications of a spiritual perspective. If you believe it's up to money for God to do it, if you believe God needs your money to do it, right? If you believe I can do it without God by money or ability, then it's not God. So by actual qualification, God says when he moves, it's not his first priority. I, I, I have to be honest with you, when we stepped into this building, the last thing we had and still have in the natural is the money to do it. Some people think, oh, you saved and you moved. We had savings. We had, uh, in total, with all the giving and all the churches overseas giving us money and our savings, nine million. But we moved into a 20 million rand budget. And to this day, I don't give the exact number, but we still have not raised the 20 million. And it has been a step by step trust in God. But what moves first, money or the Spirit of God, right? Well, I can tell you right now, we're living in a God move first. In fact, I told someone by the flesh the other day, in my flesh, in truth, if I had known how much we would have raised before we moved, I wouldn't have moved. I much preferred having millions in the bank. Do you know? Now, please do not sit in fear. But recently, on the first of the month, after all the costs that came in into our building, because you know every month there's more stuff, there's more stuff that needs to get done, there's more stuff that needs to get put in every, every month, we, we came down to a pretty close to zero balance. But it's not, I'm not paying the budget. And if I get into that mindset, it's not good for me. Now, there needs to be wisdom, absolutely. We don't operate in foolishness, but foolishness, wisdom is never void of faith. Wisdom is not fear. So people look at me and go, I don't know how you do it, and the truth is, I don't know, but we're in it, and we're walking with God, right? Right? And I don't think our church will ever have, and I can tell you scripturally, I don't think we will ever have enough money for the vision God has given us. 
Because if we have the money, why do we need the Lord? You just buy it. You just possess it with finance. I remember a church, now, listen to me, I remember a senior pastor of one of the largest churches in the world saying to me, often a church that is debt-free is a church not growing. And I'm not saying live in debt. Don't come to me with scripture now about being debt-free. I'm saying the atmosphere of a spirit that says, because we've got the money, then God can move, is the wrong spirit. Okay? You will never have enough money to pay for the stuff in life that is coming your way, in the natural. You get married, you're like, I don't have enough money for marriage. But you've got to get married to have enough money for marriage because it's responding to God's word in faith that brings favor. In fact, I tell men, if you're dating your wife, your business won't be successful. If you are dating your future spouse and just living in engagement, living in dating, you, because God says when you find a wife, it releases favor. All right? But you'll never have enough money for your spouse. You'll never have enough money for your kids. Oh, you don't know. We never had enough money for our first child. Had Jonathan, right? We grew by the grace of God. We're on three kids. Our school bill is enough to pay for a school, right? <laughs> and the school that we're at has been so gracious in helping us, right? But the point I'm trying to make is in the natural, you never have enough because you need God, right? And it's okay to put that burden on God. It's okay to say, hey, that's not my responsibility. I must be spirit led. Like, and don't ever, people come to me and say to me, Pastor, you know, I don't know how to pay my bills. And I say, Do you follow God with your finances? No. Well, that's why. But I'm ne I don't have enough to actually tithe. You will, you, you'll just never, ever have enough. Because it's not about I first do it naturally and then deal with spiritually. It's you first align spiritually. All right? And, and trust me, God doesn't need your finance. You need his favor. You want his favor, right? And I don't preach about the tithe because I need your money. I preach about the tithe because we've lived for the first three and a half years in this church. Tara and I never earned a cent from Redemption Church. We lived completely on the generosity of people giving to us outside of the church, who were not in the church, by the way. But we didn't stop. You know, I've heard people, I, I, I serve the Lord. I, I, I work for the church. It's not about God taking your money. It's about giving him the burden of your financial provision. And I'm, I didn't even want to say that. But align yourself, not with natural ability and natural wealth, because then who gets the glory? Some people say to me, you know, Pastor, are you praying God for a billionaire to join your church and pay the budget? No. In the natural, Yes. By the Spirit, no. Because then it's like, oh, that person paid for everything. Makes sense. God gets no glory. Right? So it's okay if that happens, but then we'll just have to enlarge our budget, enlarge our vision. All right? And so, and so for me, never ever let it be a, yeah, oh, it's naturally possible. It's never naturally possible to do with God what He's designed for your life. Never. Okay? Second thing is power. That word there for power is very interesting, right? It's not wealth or ability, it's human strength. Some of you are strong. Most of you are strong. But do you know that can be a weakness? I'm strong. It can be a weakness. I naturally gravitate to lead every room I'm in. I naturally gravitate to push things over the line. And that's how God made me. That's how God designed me. But by the flesh, it can be a limitation, so God says here, it's not by human wealth, human talent, nor by human effort, human power. If you're going into all that God has for you and your first wake-up call is, do we have the money? Do I have the talent? Do I have the power? You could be missing out on God. You could be doing it without God. In fact, I would argue you are doing it by your strength. So before we get into 2020 and all the amazing things God has for us, I'm trying to set the ground for how we walk out, how we see God use us. So then he says, it's by my spirit, not your spirit, 
right? Not chutzpah, right? Not, 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 not passion, but God's spirit. But by the Holy Spirit, okay? Jesus in John chapter 14 is talking with his disciples in riddles because it only makes sense post the fact, but at the time, they don't know what's going on. And I love it because the Bible always captures human response to godly revelation. And often human response to godly revelation, even in my life, is, huh? What? I, I was, Tara and I were talking the other day, and we have stopped trying to, we're, we're, we're trying to box God in less and less. You know, I feel like we can kind of set, set what God's put in our hearts. Hey, but we didn't plan, but God did, right? So much of our lives goes against our plans, but it's the Lord. And you have to be very careful when the Lord speaks to try and contextualize it by your current understanding. Because Jesus is telling them all about how he's about to die and be raised again. And he's bringing spiritual revelation that's amazing. But at the time, because that has yet to happen, they have no idea what he's talking about. Right? I mean, he starts to talk to them, for example, uh, let's go, John chapter 14, verse 1. Well, we'll read it together. Do not let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe in me also. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you will also may be where I am. You, do, you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas says, what? I have no idea what you're talking about. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how on earth can we know the way? <laughs> Come on now, I, I can relate. Do you know sometimes I sit with Pastor Prince, I always record the conversations now, because I often am about a year to two years behind in it actually resounding with me. And that's okay. I, I'm, I'm, we went now to Singapore in August, and we sat, and he ministered for 14 hours nonstop. And, and it was for church leaders, and there's, there's three key... Oh, I don't want to get into it now. Anyways, he didn't even get to the other two keys. One key was 14 hours, okay? And it was unbelievable. I mean... You just sit there and you're like, this Bible is unbelievable. This God is incredible. But you know, half of it just goes over my head because it's okay. All right, write it down. You know, make notes. Don't worry. Uh, you can catch up. It's okay to be behind the times, you know. So Thomas, I like sometimes the Bible because it captures what people are really thinking. You know, often with Pastor Prince, there'll be four or five of us around the table and everyone's nodding and I'm not because you can read me like a book. You can read me like a book, you know. Um, Tara can even tell if I'm lying over the phone. <laughs> it's true. She'll say, I know you're lying. Why? I can just hear your voice. <laughs> so I, there's no hiding anything in my life. And Pastor Prince will say, Josh, you look lost. I'm like, I'm completely lost. Have no idea. Or he'll say, have you not listened to that? Or have you not studied that yet? Have you not preached that yet? Really? I mean, I'm like, hey, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, I'm on the journey here. Okay? So Thomas says, Jesus, hang on a second here. First of all, you're talking about a house. I don't even know what you mean. Is this Joseph's house? Is this a house somewhere in Nazareth or Beth? What are we? What are you? And then you say we know how to get there, and you're talking about a place I don't even know. How on earth am I going to get there? And Jesus is speaking in Revelation about what is to come. All right? So he says, I am the way, even more confusing, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father. From now on, you do know him, and you've seen God. Philip says, what? <laughs> if you just show us God, let us literally see him, then we'll, then we'll accept what you're saying. So, no one has accepted they know where the house is. No one has accepted they know the way. And now they're telling him, now you say, we've seen you, we've seen God. Just please, give us the easy way out. Just show us God. You know, people come to me and they say to me, Pastor, you know, 
you come with this word for the year, or you come with a re- but I, I just want to see it happen. You know, seeing is not believing. How do you know that? I can prove it to you from Scripture. Jesus resurrected. Okay, you know he did. He didn't get. He didn't get killed in a in a in a, in a secret prison cell with no one watching. He was killed with thousands of witnesses throughout the day, right? Jesus dies, is raised from the dead, comes back with the wounds as the raised Christ, okay? Is speaking to a group of people whilst levitating and says, like this, in the sky, go to Jerusalem, wait there, I will send someone. I'll send my spirit. It is believed that the minimum size crowd, Jesus resurrected with a physical body, but literally as a ghost, levitating, is witnessed by close to 500, possibly 1,000 people. 120 go. And then he goes into the sky. The majority went... Sheesh, that's incredible. Oh, but I've got stuff to do. (laughs) Seeing God do the obvious doesn't result in believing. Witnessing a miracle doesn't result in believing. Just because you see it doesn't necessarily, it never translates into just automatically taking care of faith. Right? You have to believe it, right? So then Jesus goes on to say, right, Philip, 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 I've been among you for such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. So he's going, Philip, it might be a stretch for you to believe I'm God, but you've seen me raise people from the dead. Some of the places Jesus went to, he healed everyone in the village. You've seen me walk on water. You know, you've seen miracles. So if you don't even believe conceptually or philosophically I am God, just accept that I've done things that humanity can't do, right? Right? And I kind of like how God has like layers of faith. It's like if you can't believe in the ultimate big picture, just accept I've done some pretty amazing things in front of you and let that be a starting point. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Because I go to the Father... And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, what he's saying is, you will step into the space I occupy, and you will take the space of being God's hands and feet on earth. I've done all these miracles. I'm God. I'm releasing you now to walk in this calling and this anointing to be where heaven touches earth. But the way you step into that is because I've got to leave. Because as long as I'm around, you just look at me. Right? Come on, if Jesus it was here in person and a, and, a, and a sick person came in the room, who here would go, I'll pray. Everyone would go, Jesus is down there in the front. Right? So Jesus says, I've got to leave so that you can do this right? Let me just say this. This is true to everything in life, even following the call of God. It is not practical to try and build a church on a person besides Jesus. Sometimes Tara and I were sitting at our dream team end of year function, and it was the best. It was out of this world, but it was because the two of us had nothing to do with it. Other people had to rise up into their giftings and callings and step into that space. And we must always be very careful that we build based on a person's gifting and ability, right? We've got to be careful to think the church of Jesus Christ is actually the church of Joshua McCauley. 
You are the church. We are the church. No, but pastor, I like you preaching every Sunday. But then you are discounting the fact that God can work through someone else even greater. Amen? Now, I believe in us walking in our giftings and our callings. I'll never abandon that. By the grace of God, I will be full of godly character and remain true till Jesus comes or I go to heaven. But the point is to build like I am the only person who can preach and speak and release is not a godly perspective. Amen? You are who knows who's sitting here. Who knows who's sitting in Holland? Who knows who's sitting... I would have to say, I know the future church. Okay. Getting quiet in here. It's okay. I'm cool. You know, if someone else preaches and I'm not sure, and people say, you know, Pastor, I hate to say this, but you, they were actually pretty amazing. I'm encouraged. Like, I, I think of, I think of 10,000 churches, not just one. Not for me, but for what God wants to do. And I love the fact of thinking, hey, we're not limited to a person. In fact, usually when someone says, I'll show this church, I'm going to leave. Be very, it's, it's, I remember, uh, I remember having conversations with someone and, and, and can I just say this? God always, he's never held to a person. He's never held to one person's life. It's, it's his church. And I'm always excited for expansion and opportunity because it pushes people into their destinies. It releases calls, pulls people out of sitting in the church and just being seated to actually being activated in what God is doing and how God is moving. Some of our dream team leaders had never spoken about Jesus and today are leading teams of hundreds of people talking about Jesus, sharing scripture. That's the Holy Spirit working through them. But you know what? It's incredible to see how God just is raising up people and he's never going to stop. And I believe it's always something happening, okay? So Jesus says, I got to leave and my absence physically pulls you into actually physically occupying. So we love the scripture. We love, or should I say, we, we, we often hear you'll do greater things than Jesus did in the church for the gospel. But you know what? He doesn't stop speaking. He then highlights how. Through whom? What's going to change? Right? And he says in verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help. So you cannot do the works of Jesus in your own strength. You need the Holy Spirit. He's going to help you to bring heaven to earth. He's going to actually be with you, walking with you, right? And he says here, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be. So at this time, he isn't in them. He's around them but soon he will be in them. Why could the Holy Spirit not be inside people? Because they were not clean. They were still sin covered. They had yet to be fully redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So Jesus is speaking, this will happen, and the Holy Spirit will not just be around you or on you, but he will become a part of you. Amen? But he's not a controller. He's a helper. He cannot take over. Some people say to me, Pastor, how do I have more of the Holy Spirit? I say, give him one thing. What's that? Space. Room. So what do we do? We go in by natural wealth, by natural talent, natural force, and that shuts out the room. Shh, helper. I'll ask you if I need help, but I know how to do this. I've got the money, it's fine. Right? I've got the strength, I've got the ability, I know how to do this. Don't need you. It's interesting though that in the Old Testament, whenever the Spirit of God came upon someone, they operated 
in partnership with God, but the result was supernatural things happened, supernatural victories. And so the nation of Israel in the Old Testament really revered when the Holy Spirit came upon someone. They loved it. They invited it. Because for them, it, was a, it, was, it got them out of slavery. It conquered. It was like, oh my goodness, the battles won. But then when we receive Jesus and we go to live this life, we don't actually recognize the weight and the power that we have the ability to operate in, but it's nullified when we go by natural might, natural power, wealth, talent, force. Right? So Jesus says, I won't leave you as orphans, I'll come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you will live, you will also live. I, I honestly would be sitting here going, I have no idea what you're talking about. You live, but you're going to go away. But then I'll live because you live, but you're alive right now. Like, what are you, you know, he's talking about, I die and I'm raised again. Now that I'm raised again, you have eternal life. It all makes sense post that, but I would have been interjecting the whole time. You know, I would look around at the other side and say, what are you nodding at? You have no idea what's going on. I want to do that sometimes. The pastor prince turn to my mates. You have no idea what he's saying right now. Stop nodding. You're just acting like you just don't want to be exposed, right? On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you in me, and I am in you. What? Right? Let's go down to verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Do you know that these verses have, have no meaning without the New Testament and the revelation by the Holy Spirit of Paul? You know, be very careful to live your life according to red letters in a way or a mindset that says that's all God ever said. Because Jesus said it by person doesn't mean it wasn't Jesus saying it through Paul. So never ever take what Jesus said above what Jesus said in the end. Same God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? And if you want to know what you emphasize, you should actually emphasize the last thing someone says, not necessarily the first thing. You should read the first thing through the last thing, right? Because that's where the full understanding comes into play. And Jesus even said, so much I want to tell you, I can't tell you right now because I can't. But the Holy Spirit will reveal, will teach, okay? So he's talking here and he's speaking about how the Holy Spirit functions with us. He's going to teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. He'll back it up. And with this revelation, peace I'll leave you, peace I'll give you, not like the world has, your hearts won't be troubled, they won't be afraid. So even Jesus is emphasizing you're going to go do amazing things, but the way you do amazing things is with someone's help. Not by yourself. Someone's got to go with you. Someone's got to be advising you. Someone's got to be guiding you. Someone has to be helping you. I don't know about you, but I never read manuals. And if I did, I'd save myself so much time and so much frustration. Why doesn't this? What? Tara would say, have you read the manual? Leave me alone. Just took it out the box. And then, I don't know if you're like me, you end up going back to the box. <sighs> okay. Step one. I just want the finished product. I don't want step one. I don't want step two. I don't want step three. I don't want step four, right? That's how we live our lives. I just want the result. Just, just give me the... Just no, step by step, right? Holy Spirit's going to show you today, for now, right? But I'm called to preach to millions. What are you doing with five people? What are you doing with one person? What do, you, do you get what I'm trying to say? I'm called to be a multi-billionaire business person. Okay? 
Now the Holy Spirit is how you get there. But it's day by day, right? It isn't some weird thing that isolates you, right? In fact, actually what's interesting is the Holy Spirit is always attached to unity. Do you know in Acts chapter 1, before the Holy Spirit comes in chapter 2, the last part of Acts chapter 1 is the disciples and the followers of Jesus gathered in the room talking about the fact that some people have left, some people have died, some people have walked away. What are we going to do now about this thing we're supposed to do? And only after they unified around what God had asked them to do, which is the local church, was the power of God given. Do you know that unity, God commands a blessing over unity? Do you know that? You know, I, I, I was saying this in another sermon recently. A famous coach was asked after a game. They were very lucky and they won. And they said, Do you, are you embarrassed by luck? And he said, no, because luck works every time. He said, I've never seen a lucky team lose. They're called a, it's a lucky game because you won. Right? It's an unlucky game when you lose. And he said, I've seen wealthy teams lose, the best players lose, the best game plans lose, but luck works every time. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, you know what? Blessing works every time. And so you don't need to have the plan, have the money, have the resource, but if you're unified around God's vision, he commands a blessing. Amen? He sends a blessing. It's not just you can have it, it comes whether you like it or not. So they unify in Acts chapter 1 around taking the gospel out and then the Holy Spirit comes. So how does the devil stop the Holy Spirit moving in power and in strength? Disunity. That's why he comes to destroy marriages. Because if there's unity at its core in your life, there will be blessing in your business, blessing in your health, blessing in your finances, but that's why he comes after the marriage. Not after your health, not after your finances, not after your coworker, after where unity is represented at its core, which is a picture of the church, by the way. Groom and bride. Just to let you know. At its core, it's a picture of the church. Okay? So he always comes around unity. He loves unity. He loves it when we understand that we are given to be together. For example, in Romans chapter 15, Verses 5, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the pastor. No, glorify yourselves. No, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, therefore receive one another just as Christ did. In other words, hey, Come on, we're one church. We're Jew and Gentile, but we're one church. And let's get together. And then in verse 13, he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jude chapter 16, he describes two groups of people, right? Verse 16. These are grumblers and complainers walking around to their own lusts. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Holy Spirit. But you, beloved building yourselves up on your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Tongues is not primarily for others. It is for you. Right? Now, tongues with interpretation is for others, but that is often, it is very rare that that actually happens. All right, even in the pattern of the Old Testament, tongues by Paul's emphasis and the early church's emphasis is for you, building you, leading you, 
guiding you. Next year, a big part of next year is us stirring up, Paul says in Timothy, the gift. Stirring up the gift that is in you, that strengthens you, right? Working tongues into your daily life. Why is that important? Because when you go into a business meeting, what's your first call? What's the budget? What can I fix? How am I going to move this along? But if you don't pray by the Spirit, you make no room for the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you. You make no room for God to give you answers, right? In your home, praying in tongues. How often do we use our mouths to fight, to nitpick, to judge, right? You, you, pray in tongues, right? Pray in tongues. Because sometimes you're just tired and cranky, right? You need sleep. You're hangry. You need food. But letting the gift of God stir up inside of you so that you can operate by the Spirit of God, right? It's the Spirit of God. Now I want to tell you something. Go back to Zechariah 4, verses 6. When you look at that word, but by my Spirit, do you want to know what that word means? Okay, first, Holy Spirit. That's awesome, Pastor. I think that's where you were going from the beginning. Fantastic. It also means the word wind. Right? The wind of God. The flow of God. I've never seen the wind, but I felt the wind. And so often our lives can take the course that God wants for us. If all we do is think like a sailor and set our sails to catch the wind. God, my whole expectation, my resource, my ability is raised and hoisted in the air, but I'm not the wind. I don't create the wind. My responsibility is to actually partner with the wind to pull me where I need to go, to take me where. Have you ever seen, you know, when sailors are sitting and the wind is pulling a boat? They're not like sweating, you know what I mean? Like, they're not blowing in the sails. They're just parking off, steering the ship, right? And there's so much in this. Like the Bible even talks about your mouth is like a rudder. Look, anyways. But harness the wind, right? So that word there for my spirit also means wind. It also means breath. The breath of God. Right? God always speaking, always leading, always guiding. God always moving. It also means the word when you give prophecy, right? Now, let's not get sidetracked because prophecy has to be, right, edifying. It is never God when it is not edifying. It doesn't build you. So, but prophecy ties into this word as well. Something else that blew my mind, this word is also used for giving energy for battle. So it's like you're going into a battle and you're like, I'm tired, I'm worn out. How am I gonna take this on God? This enemy is much bigger than me. That spirit is like a re-energizing. It's like, a, it's like it steps in, it's like powering up. Any of you play games, my kids are starting to play like fighting games and stuff again. You know, it's like you're on low energy and then you get something, it's like whoop, and all of a sudden, it's literally like it equips you for battle, but it energizes you in battle. It's your strength in battle. In fact, the, the language of Scripture there is, is actually strength for warfare, right? It is also strength for administration. It is the ability to run companies, run nations, run governments, run homes, Right? I would argue it's harder to run a home than it is to run a government. Well, it is in our home, right? We have three very energized, different children, and you need wisdom. But it's strengthful administration, right? It's also written as strength for wielding executive power. Look, it's incredible. This doesn't just cover showing up and making miracles happen. This covers day-to-day -day living from its smallest space to its greatest responsibility. The 
the greatest thing about God's Holy Spirit is it's a grace gift. All the gifts of the Spirit, the charisma gifts are gifts, grace gifts. The word therefore, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the actual Bible is grace gifts. You don't work for them. You don't earn them. But you can not operate in them if you decide to do it by human might, human power. You can nullify God moving if you're like, I've got this, I can do this, I'm ready for this. Now, with God you are, but without God, you're not. So I wanna invite you to see what you're dealing with, to see what you're learning. Maybe this year hasn't been your best year. Maybe right now you're facing some challenges, but, but lay aside your hurt, your emotion, or maybe what you look at in the natural, and tune your ear, or you could say, align yourself to the wind of God, and see that actually, maybe what you're learning now is something you need to know for where you're going. Maybe what you're facing right now, when you solve that and you walk in that by the Spirit, equips you for something so much greater. I feel like 2019 is a year, not of setbacks, but actually setups. We'll only see it in the future that what God was doing, wow, right? But number one on our list, I don't care how big a CEO or how small a person in an organization you are, I don't care if you, you're single, been married a long time, kids, no kids, grandkids, whatever season of life you're in, re-engage with the Holy Spirit for next year. Re-engage with your, your gift of tongues for next year. Re-engage in what God wants to do and is doing on the inside of you. Then God can do anything and will. In fact, Jesus says, whatever you ask, whatever you ask in this context, I can do, I will do, right? But the Holy Spirit is as big a part of that as you are. Amen.